and the very difficulties that Kathy is sort of experiencing as she's trying to work out what is a briefing and what is a workshop and what is this and what is that, I think are going to become compounded if we have these additional layers. I would be interested as to whether or not the Auditor General has considered the matter of where this should be reported back. Because the, the advice that I've had is that the work of this committee will be complete on the report back to the IHP and everything that flows on from that needs to be very clear and fettered. Um, we don't want any complications, so I just appreciate your advice on that. I guess my advice would be that um, you, you should seek advice from council officers about the best legal process and make sure that you're complying with that process, but it's, it's not something that we, we could advise you on. Thank you. So we can clarify that, Councillor. Any other questions? Um, Goes to the question no? Shall we yeah. move on? Thank you very much um, for that. <coughs> Certainly very, very clear and <coughs> no two ways about it. We need to watch ourselves every step of the way on this one. Thank you. So I think our final part of the presentation is Thank you. Right, thank you, Madam Chair. It's a very short presentation uh, from me this afternoon. So this one is just on uh, what to expect uh, when we receive the recommendations from the independent hearings panel. So one slide essentially, plus we also have a, a timeline diagram that's an updated version of one that you may have seen before. It was emailed to you several weeks ago. So this is just the latest version with some new dates added. So what will, will we receive from the panel? Um, so the panel has advised that um, the recommendations will be in two parts. Part one will be a series of reports um, and there will be an overview report and approximately 60 topic reports aligning with the 60 or so, or generally aligning with the 60 or so hearings that the panel held <coughs> over 20 months of hearings. So things like residential, that would be a topic. Uh, rural, we would expect, would be a topic. Um, Ecological areas may well be a topic. Those are the sorts of things we mean when we say topics. So each of those will have a report, but there's also an overarching report that explains, I guess, just some of the key findings of the panel and the way the panel has gone about its um, exercise of um, reviewing the submissions, considering the evidence, and making its recommendations. So within each of these topic reports, there will be a summary of the key findings from the panel on that topic. Um, and any recommended changes to the um, proposed entry plan. And we expect that, that, that the reports will run to some roughly about a thousand pages, so it's a pretty comprehensive, fairly detailed um, report that we expect in part one. Then part two is actually a revised proposed Auckland Gendry plan. It's the text and the maps. The maps will not be in hard copy. <coughs> they won't be in PDF format. They will be a uh, uh, what we call a dynamic GIS viewer. So you, you're familiar with how the GIS viewer works. They're essentially, uh, they've got their own GIS viewer and they will be flipping that around uh, so that uh, the council can see um, its maps in a GIS viewer. So it's quite a, uh, quite a new approach, but um, it's definitely the way that things have been heading in terms of maps and planning for quite some time. So those are the two parts. Um, the um, text will be entirely clean, so it won't be a strike through underlining approach. Um, there could be many reasons for that, but I, I guess one of the key ones is once you start restructuring the unitary plan, you end up with so much strike through and underlining that it becomes very confusing for a reader. Um, so the benefit of showing what's been deleted with a strike through and underlined for any new text uh, vanishes. So it will be clean text, um, clean maps in a GIS viewer, and that's part two. Now, just turning to the timeline that we've all got here, I'm wondering if maybe we can... It's probably too small to really see on the screen, but we'll pop it up anyway. Uh, so here we are, just a, f a few days out from the 22nd of July. I've got 
pointer there. So a few days out from 22nd July, that's this Friday, I, th I think roughly at about three o'clock, <coughs> we expect the panel will deliver the um, recommendations to our chief e executive. Uh, and then on the 27th of July, that's next Wednesday, there'll be a confidential briefing for the Auckland Development Committee at 9am. Uh, and then at 12.30pm on the 27th of July, and, and sorry, at that, at that briefing, um, we will present an overview of um, what um, we as staff have identified in reading the recommendations as, I guess, the key uh, changes in approach that the panel is recommending relative to the council's position at the hearings. So uh, where, the, where the panel is recommending to do something quite different to uh, what the council sought at the hearings, we'd certainly be looking at um, giving you a briefing on that so you're very clear on where the panel is headed in a different direction to the council. At that briefing, we'll focus on the 19 topics that the Auckland Development Committee has um, endorsed as its key area of focus in the past, but that does cover a very broad spectrum of topics in the unitary plan. Uh, then at 12.30 on the, on the Wednesday next week, uh, we will publish uh, on the Council website all of the panel's um, recommendations, all of the 60 reports plus the overview report, uh, plus the clean uh, text of the panel's recommended version of the unitary plan, and then we will be able to show to the public, the GIS viewer, uh, that, that has all of the maps as recommended by the panel. <laughs> At that point, those maps on the text have no uh, legal standing. They are simply the recommendations from the independent hearings panel in terms of what the unitary plan should look like. If we move forward to the um, 3rd to the 5th of August, um, now, originally that was the 3rd and the 4th of August, but um, we're aware that um, there is a committee meeting on the 4th of August, so we've added an additional date on the 5th for um, councillors to um, arrange <coughs> an appointment with a, a planner um, or planners to um, uh, find out further information about the panel's recommendations. Uh, those sessions are not intended to be a discussion about the merit of the panel's recommendations or what officers might think about those recommendations. It's simply um, uh, clarifying what the panel has recommended and assisting with finding any recommendations if councillors have uh, yet uh, to find the recommendations that they're after. We're, we're very hopeful that your support staff will assist you during that period between the 27th of July and right through to the decision making uh, later in August. So then we move forward to the uh, committee dates between the uh, 10th and the 12th and the 15th and 18th of August. Again, in, the, in this updated version, we've added in two extra days of committee meetings on the 10th, sorry, three, 10th, 11th and 12th. So originally, I think it was, um, no, sorry, it was originally the 12th, 15th, 16th, 17th and 18th. So two extra committee days have been added um, to just enable sufficient time for the um, Council to consider the panel's <coughs> recommendations. Um, there will be a, an officer's report accompanying the, um, uh, for that meeting, and in that report, which um, will go out in advance of the 10th of August, uh, there will be officer recommendations to either accept panel recommendations on those various topics or um, potentially um, uh, recommendations to reject panel recommendations. Where, the, uh, where officers uh, have recommended to uh, accept a panel recommendation that differs from the council position, uh, just by way of a bit of information, a, a reason for that might, may well be that um, through monitoring the panel's recommendations uh, in its version of the proposed unitary plan over time um, and potentially um, addressing the issues through a plan change, that may be a better approach than rejecting the recommendations, but until we see the recommendations, we really, we really can't say any more than that. So that's the, uh, up till the 18th of August, um, <coughs> and on the 19th of August, that is the statutory date that Catherine has mentioned, that we've mentioned many times before, the 20 working days um, from the 22nd of July finishes on the 19th of August, and the Council must uh, notify its decisions to um, accept or reject the panel's recommendations, and if rejecting any recommendation, the Council must be very clear as to what the alternative provisions are. And just to recap again, the only way to extend that time period would be if the Minister for the Environment agrees, and the Minister can only agree to extend up to an additional 20 working days. And then on the 16th of September, that is the 20 working day um, <coughs> date, and that is when the appeal period closes on all provisions apart from the designations, which have an extra 10 working days 
for parties to lodge appeals based on the parameters that um, Catherine outlined earlier. So that's um, it from me, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question, John. In the context of uh, Council adhering to the law uh, under the Auckland Council Act uh, in providing information to uh, the Independent Māori Statutory Board, uh, when will the board receive the recommendations uh, that you say you're receiving at three o'clock today? Um, I'll answer that, John. Two days. Uh, <coughs> just to be clear, the independent hearings panel will be delivering, at, not at three o'clock on Friday, it will be after four o'clock. They've told us that they won't be able to deliver it. Uh, in terms of um, the 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 IMSB board will receive the information at the same time as the governing body receives the information, which is on the Wednesday. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Any other questions? Easy. I easy. <coughs> I see. Just on the back, questions and answers for councillors. There's another version of local board members' ability to speak out on the unitary plan here, which is different to that which was in the two memos and what, which, what Catherine said earlier. Yeah, the question is, can local board members speak to the public about the unitary plan? Answer, local board members will not be making decisions about the unitary plan. Governing body does this. Therefore, local board members don't have the same legal constraints as councillors do. Yep. Yep. Which means, that's, yes, you can. Well, I believe that's consistent with the uh, memorandum that went out. Yeah. Yeah. So we're saying, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> The local board members can speak to the public and speak to the media about the unitary plan. Yes, they always can. have been able to because they are not decision makers. The expectation, however, as we said, just to repeat what we said, the expectation is that the boards will respect the fact that we're now going into a decision making phase and hopefully will work with us on that one. But there's no guarantees and no legal obligations for them to do so. Other questions? Councillor Brewer. Thank you. Um, John, it was, it was put to us previously, and I think it's important to canvas again, um, that if we don't, if we weren't to go through uh, the process of rejecting a recommendation and, and the Section 32 analysis and business case and everything else that that would entail, particularly around localised issues, it's been suggested that perhaps we could table a um, a council plan, a futuristic, a future council plan change. Uh, that that when that when the unitary plan became operative, a future administration uh, could tackle at that point uh, as a as a council plan change. And I just wondered, is that still on the table? What would it look like? Would it be footnoted in in our minutes? Uh, and would it at all carry? any, um, you know, would it be binding for a future administration or would it just be a, a kind of a, a footnote that that councillors could go out to their communities and say, oh, well, I tried and maybe an, the next council might be able to turn it into a, we'll, we'll at least review it as a as a plan change possibility. It's a tricky one, that one, but um, it, it would probably be more likely to take the form of a, a recommendation to uh, review how the provisions are operating with a view to um, possibly introducing a plan change if they're not um, working properly or not achieving a good outcome in the future. But um, any future um, committee with the delegated authority could um, make its own determination at a future date. So it's, it, it, has it, it, would be, it would not be binding. No. But it was something that, it, it's not my suggestion, it was a suggestion that came out of your department that that may be <coughs> an eloquent way that, that, that councillors could put something on the table where if they could uh, converse enough support from, on, from their council colleagues to at least indicate that the recommendation wasn't completely satisfactory and that a future administration may look at it as a plan change. Is, is that something that you're still able to work with a, a process like that, or, or ideally not? I, I, my view is the committee is, is free and able to uh, make those sorts of resolutions. I guess we just have to be very careful that it's not seen as completely undermining the process that we've been through. That would be the only advice, or the main advice that we, we would give. Thank you. 